The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled The Future is Now in MDS, Integrating Innovative Risk-Adapted Therapies into Patient Management. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash PMQ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for uh, uh, being here. Uh, my name is Guillermo Garcia Manero from MD Anderson, and uh, we're very excited about this uh, symposium. The title, as you can see, is The Future is Now in MDS, and Integrative Innovative Risk-Adapted Therapies into Patient uh, Management. So I'm actually extremely uh, happy to be with uh, two very close uh, colleagues, uh, Dr. Joseph Corey, who is now uh, the head of pathology at University of Nebraska, but he was the hematopathologist to go at uh, MD Anderson until uh, uh, a few months ago. And then uh, Dr. Aditi uh, Shastri uh, from Albert Einstein in, in New York, who has been very kind uh, to help us because unfortunately Dr. Savona for some uh, unexpected issues cannot be with us uh, uh, today. And let's start a little bit with a very short uh, introduction. This is interesting slide because uh, you've seen similar diagram for acute myelogenous leukemia, right? And you see like this plethora of uh, flux and things. And it's obvious that there is quite a bit of, of transformation in, in this kind of causing disease. But I think we're starting to accelerate actually what we do in myelodysplastic uh, syndrome. So in the 70s, we had kind of like the first take on what cytogenetics meant for this disease. And then in 1997, we had the IPSS classification that you, know, you would think now is very obsolete but it became a really fundamental framework for us to start thinking systematically about uh, myelodysplastic syndrome. And then in the early part of my career, you know, because I became faculty in 99, 2000, you know, we were really working extremely hard with uh, these three compounds. Uh, it's a cytadine approved uh, in 2004, uh, lenalidomide in 2005, then the cytadine in 2006. So during those uh, years, I thought we were gonna be getting a new drug for our patients every year, so I thought it was gonna be great. Of course, this didn't happen until a couple of years ago. But then actually, thanks to people like uh, Dr. Hori and, and, and others, you know, we started to understand the biology of this disease, the true impact of cytogenetics. I think fundamentally, I'm gonna hear this in a second, the impact of next generation sequencing. I think this is really transforming how we see this disorder. So you see there kind of like a valley or a nadir of like almost what, uh, 10 years or so where most of the data was on new classifications such as the IPSSR. We saw a lot of data on new genes, new molecular classifications. And then the reality is that in 2020, perhaps because we were in the middle of COVID, we didn't really have the splash that we expected, but we saw two drugs approved for patients with myelodysplastic syndrome. So TGF beta modulator, uh, Luspatercept for patients with uh, uh, early stage uh, disease. And then uh, uh, the first uh, oral hypomethylating agent for myelodysplastic syndrome that is this combination of uh, cetazuridine, cytidine deaminase inhibitor with uh, the cytabine. So this happened back to back in 2020. Then actually after several years of waiting for this, a few months ago we saw the publication of the IPSSM. I think this is actually a major tool. This is really transforming how I, at least I see my patients in, in my clinic, and I think we're gonna start incorporating these tools as, as we practice. And uh, in this symposium today and through the ASH meeting, you're gonna start you know, seeing more and more mature data from some of these doublets that are now basically finishing their phase, phase three trials, and hopefully one, two, three of them, hopefully all of them, will be uh, positive studies that will allow us to have uh, more therapy. So I think we need to keep uh, uh, you know, participating in these clinical trials and really being enthusiastic about uh, our research on, in this field. That said, I don't think I have to really tell this audience that outcomes in this disease are still really uh, are suboptimal. The cure rates are minimal, except you, you know, unless you can really uh, transplant your, your patient. So this is data from this Connect uh, Myeloid Disease Registry. This is a real world uh, uh, data set from many institutions, uh, at least in, uh, uh, in multiple centers in the United States. And you see there actually that the expectations, even in patients with low risk disease, are really suboptimal, actually significantly lower than what the IPSS or IPSSR uh, will tell us. And then it's for sure we need better therapies for uh, risk adapted uh, uh, approaches. So in high risk disease, you know, we live in this idea that maybe survival is around two years, but that's actually if you get treated. 
this uh, connect the data will show maybe survivals that are close to one year in patients with high risk disease, so we need to really do better. We're really facing this uh, uh, phenomenon of these patients with P53 uh, mutated disease, high risk cytogenetics with very poor prognosis, etc. And there's basically uh, a lack of uh, effective therapeutics for uh, those groups of patients. So we still have a lot of work to, to do. And I think with that, uh, uh, Joseph, uh, this is your turn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for uh, being uh, part of this session. It is really my honor and privilege to be speaking alongside my esteemed colleagues here. So um, as Dr. Garcia Monero uh, mentioned, uh, really there has been a lot of changes in the past, I would say, few months in terms of MDS classification and the framework for MDS classification. And I think I'd be remiss if I don't preset the stage by walking you through another uh, historical timeline, and that is that of the World Health Organization classification of tumors, which really has its roots going back to 1952, when the initial discussion happened at the United Nations World Health Assembly, and a decision was made to begin putting together at a global scale a framework for classifying and defining cancers. Well, this uh, took really many, many decades of hard work, evolution, growth that uh, I will not go through today, uh, but really to kind of walk us uh, through where we stand in 2022, the end of 2022, where we have now a fifth edition of the WHO classification of tumors. This has moved from simple paper, paper manuscripts uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s, all the way really to the 1980s, to now a, an entire database for the classification of cancers that really defines those cancers on a global scale and provides a, a standard across which policymakers, insurers, and physicians and scientists base their, uh, their, their, their decisions and really working frameworks. The WHO classification today uh, exists for all organ systems. It resides online as well as on print. And the hematolymphoid classification, which will be the focus of today's discussion, is really one component of this big, enormous body of work. For the fifth edition, uh, as you can imagine, uh, just like with prior editions, but as knowledge increases and grows, it's taken, I would say, a bigger village than ever before. So the fifth edition overall has taken the contributions of over 1,600 authors across all volumes of the classification. For the hematolymphoid book alone, between editors and authors, it's been over 420 individuals from all over the world, from countries that you see highlighted at the bottom of this slide, that have come together, brought their expertise in a multidisciplinary fashion, oncologists, pathologists, epidemiologists, geneticists, etc., to uh, make things happen. Focusing on MDS, what were some of the high-level classification gaps that uh, we went in with an aim to hopefully address in the current classification? Well, the first gap was whether to reconsider the nomenclature of MDS as myelodysplastic syndromes because of reports and, and some, some thoughts coming from over the world about the word syndrome uh, being uh, associated sometimes with a non-neoplastic entity. Uh, that took uh, considerable discussions, uh, and the decision was made to move forward with the term myelodysplastic neoplasms, but in the interest of continuity and to avoid some phonetic overlap between what we would have perhaps called MDN and MPN to stick with the abbreviation MDS. Another uh, classification gap was really reassessing the boundary between low uh, 
between pre-neoplastic conditions, and I will go into more details in the next few slides, and MDS, and the boundary between MDS and AML. The third gap was really asking, are there additional MDS types that are molecularly defined that we need to revisit or reconsider and add to the classification scheme? The other gap, the next gap, is, is what to do with hypoplastic MDS. Many of us have seen and uh, managed and treated uh, patients with hypoplastic MDS, and this really constitutes uh, an entity within an MDS that has uh, some unique aspects to it. I will not go into those details today, but suffice it to say that there is oftentimes an immune component and, and a component of marrow failure that has a different flavor than one would see with, with, with the more garden variety MDS, if there is such a thing. And last but not, not least um, is asking whether one wants to realign the organi organization scheme of MDS and really position it in a way that allows for knowledge growth and absorbing additional information as more high throughput sequencing and more high throughput techniques come uh, in really an unprecedented manner into, clinical, uh, into the clinical practice. This is just a partial overview of the myeloid neoplasms that are in the, in the fifth edition of the WHO classification. Um, of course, for the purposes of today's discussion, I will be focusing on those two areas. The first is really uh, something that was universally applauded and universally agreed upon, and that is the need to formalize and recognize and define clonal hematopoiesis in the WHO classification. This is a concept that has evolved over the past several years, and, and fairly, it has evolved after the last edition was published. So, um, so this, this is now defined and, and will be with us. And of course, as time goes and, and we learn more about clonal hematopoiesis, uh, it, is, it is definitely an area that will see changes and growth and, and, and more maturity in, in the years to come. The other component, of course, is myelodysplastic neoplasms, today's topic. Uh, you will notice that we, we split MDS into, uh, which, which in the WHO classification would be considered a category. We split that category into three families. MDS with defining genetic abnormalities, MDS that are morphologically defined, and MDS of childhood, or myelodysplastic neoplasms of childhood, which again is another topic that's beyond today's scope. Now, we know that we have challenges with MDS. It is a disease that can be challenging to diagnose in the clinic, in the lab, because it overlaps with non-neoplastic causes of cytopenias, and that would be always a very important uh, bifurcation point before a patient is uh, diagnosed with MDS, and that is to exclude uh, entities that might be at least on the low grade end of the spectrum, entities that might really overlap with MDS on, on the cytopenia level and on the, on, the, on the morphologic level, all the way to high grade MDS and AML. And, and you can see questions that really accompany these challenges with MDS diagnosis. This is another way of looking at it, um, and that is really kind of cre thinking about a continuum between benign entities and MDS, uh, along which anemia, thrombocytopenia, and neutropenia can, can be identified, sometimes more than one cytopenia, as well, uh, actually. So to help with this, um, one of the first things that, that, the team, uh, that the team started tackling is to really define what, these, what the preneoplastic state is, uh, and that is called CCOS, clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance, as a clonal hematopoiesis, uh, which in turn has its definition, uh, but it's a clonal hematopoiesis that's detected in the presence of one or more unexplained cytopenias uh, 
that do not meet the criteria for any of the defined myeloid neoplasms. Now, to further help set the stage and really create a harmonized framework across the board for myeloid malignancies, we harmonize the definitions for CCOS, for anemia, for cytopenias in CCOS, in MDS, and in MDS MPN. And you can see them on the screen here. I will not read them. The next component of this uh, classification framework is, is MDS, of course, the, the focus uh, that, that we are looking at today. There, we started by saying MDS is defined on the basis of cytopenia plus morphologic dysplasia. And morphologic dysplasia here would have to be at least 10% of a lineage uh, or, or more of cells uh, having dysplastic features. And you can see the details at the bottom of the slide. Uh, again, this is more for reference, uh, but you will see how MDS then was in turn split into those two families, MDS with defining genetic abnormalities and MDS that is morphologically defined. The defining genetic abnormalities that we know of today are MDS with deletion 5Q, MDS with SF3B1 mutation, and this, of course, is really the, 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 pl the place where MDS with ring sideroblasts, as these entities used to be called, would end up landing in, in over 90% 90, 90 of, of cases, if not 95%. And a new type of MDS, and that is MDS with biallelic P53 inactivation or multi-hit P53 alterations. Um, for all of these, uh, and for all actually MDSs, the, the definition retains a blast count that should be under 20%. You will see under MDS morphologically defined that we have MDS with low blasts and MDS with increased blasts. And MDS with increased blasts is uh, MDS IB1 or MDS IB2. And IB2 is when blasts are between 10 and 19% in the bone marrow. This entity, this subtype of MDS, continues to be called MDS in the WHO classification, but as has been done in prior editions, it is recognized and stated in the classification that these patients can be managed as AML patients and can also be regarded as, AML equivalent, as, as an AML equivalent diagnosis for clinical trial enrollment purposes. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the alternative proposal for MDS classification as presented by Dr. Arbor and colleagues. Uh, this uh, is referred to as the International Consensus Classification, or ICC. Uh, I, I want to at least uh, disclaim that I have not been part of this effort. Um, so you can see here side by side the, um, the, the ICC kind of framework that uh, goes from clonal cytopenias through MDS with SF3B1 mutation and with deletion 5Q and with mutated P53 onto uh, the, the, the remaining framework of MDS not otherwise specified. Uh, and they propose MDS-NOS without dysplasia, MDS-NOS with single lineage dysplasia, or MDS-NOS with multi-lineage dysplasia. And then uh, at, the, at the top of that high, uh, kind of risk uh, frame work would be MDS with excess blasts. Uh, you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, um, basically, I would say an, a, a, a comparison where, uh, where, where there's a lot of overlap. So what are some of the main changes in the new classification, the new WHO classification? Um, as we mentioned, uh, the term MDS, myelodysplastic syndromes is now MD, myelodysplastic neoplasms, abbreviated as uh, MDS. Uh, you can see the genetic types, which we have covered. Um, importantly here, uh, Cases that previously were called MDS with NPM1 mutation or N MDS with MECOM rearrangement or NOOP99 uh, rearrangements uh, can, uh, now 
qualify for being called acute myeloid leukemia, even if the blast count is under 20%. Uh, this is based on literature that shows that these patients progress very fast. Uh, that's where the cutoff of 20% between MDS and AML really uh, becomes a bit more arbitrary, and these patients need to be managed in a way that's more akin to AML than, than MDS. Uh, as we mentioned, hypoplastic MDS has been added to, the f to this uh, classification framework, and Hopefully, this will allow us to study this, this MDS type better in the years to come and, um, and, and understand better its biology and, uh, and maybe the immune uh, milieu that, that, that it arises in, in the bone marrow and, and results in, in the bone marrow. Um, MDS with low blasts is now called MDS, uh, excuse me, MDS uh, is now called MDS with low blasts when blasts are. Um, uh, less than 5% in the bone marrow, and, and you saw all the other criteria. And MDS with excess blasts is called MDS with increased blasts uh, to, to enhance clarity. Uh, the terminology for childhood MDS, in case any of you uh, see childhood MDSs in your practices, uh, has also been revised, but again, we will not cover this. And um, uh, here I'd like to mention that single lineage dysplasia versus multi lineage dysplasia in the WHO classification is optional. Uh, it's not discouraged, but it's not part of the of the of the defining uh, nomenclature of any of the MDS types. Now let's take a, take a step further. Uh, we've we've covered the classification scheme, uh, and and let's let's talk a little bit about. In, in, in today's practice, what the components of MDS evaluation are, setting the stage for an understanding the mutational landscape of MDS and really leading into risk stratification. At MD Anderson, um, which is, which is uh, uh, where I was when I prepared this slide and, and I continue to believe in it, and it is really what is also applied at the University of Nebraska, where I am now, bone marrow evaluation has multiple components. And importantly, this evaluation ideally should be done in an integrated manner as much as possible. Evaluation has to have a component of morphology. Remember, MDS in particular is defined on the basis of morphology in part. Has to have a component of flow cytometry, cytogenetics, and molecular studies. In terms of mutation profiling, having this as part of the workup of any patient with unexplained cytopenia is today, I would say, a, a fundamental component. It is hard to apply the classification. It is hard to really understand the patient's disease without some element of mutation profiling. Of course, some of the genes included in the mutation profiling panels can have diagnostic value. Others can have prognostic value, and others can be actually therapy guiding, as in the case of FLT3 or IDH1, IDH2, or KIT. And, and of course, some have uh, the benefit, give us the benefit of, all, of all, all three. Now, we've known from landmark studies that have been with us for many years that uh, clonal and subclonal driver mutations in MDS are really a, a key component of this disease. And you can see on this slide from a paper uh, by uh, uh, Ellie and, and, and colleagues from Memorial Sloan Kettering, the most common mutations that we see in MDS, really with SF3B1 topping that list, followed by TET2, SRSF2, ASXL1, and so on and so forth, with deletion 5Q actually being uh, not uncommon. But what is perhaps less common is the isolated 5Q deletion. Now, in addition to at least topping our understanding, our, our initial understanding of the mutation landscape of, of, of MDS, are earlier investigations that have shown that particular somatic mutations actually are highly associated with the risk of uh, basically with overall survival and with leukemia-free survival. And you see some genes, and these are really the most, I would say, the, some of the critical genes in that regard. Uh, 
listed on the left hand of the slide. P53 being a very important prognosticator, uh, followed by easy H2, RUNX1 as well, as well as ASXL1 and ETV6. Some of these can, be, can impart um, differential uh, prognostic uh, uh, kind of weight, but, uh, but we've, we've now uh, learned that uh, MDS can, can really be impacted by the presence of these mutations in terms of its outcome. In addition to the types of mutations, uh, some, some really elegant studies, um, uh, this, this uh, is a, a figure, again, from, from Ellie's paper in blood in 2013, uh, but others have also shown this, that the number of mutations in MDS has a prognostic impact. So it's not only what mutations, but it's the number of mutations. And sometimes it could also be the variant allelic frequency of, of the mutations in question. SF3B1 in particular has been shown by the Italian group to be linked to favorable outcomes. It has definitely been the basis for um, revisiting MDS with ring sideroblasts and, and really defining it on the basis of SF3B1 mutation. Getting into more gra granular details in terms of uh, P53 mutations, it's, uh, it's really not just the presence of P53 mutation that uh, oftentimes matters as much. It is the presence of multiple hits to the P53 gene that inactivate the, the normal allele, but yet allow the production of P53 in the cells. Um, this uh, multi-hit or biallelic uh, status um, really um, was the basis now uh, in the 2022 WHO classification to defining MDS with biallelic P53 mutations. You can see from these um, nice uh, survival graphs that uh, allelic state for P53 impacts overall survival, AML transformation, and uh, really kind of uh, overrides many of the other prognostic factors. Here's a multivariate analysis from that same paper showing that uh, multi-hit status, as you see it over here, really is, um, is, is, a, is a, a associated with a, with a high hazard ratio as, as correlated with overall survival. You can see it over here as well. Um, and. Um, it's important to note that there is a close association between biallelic P53 alterations and um, high-risk cytogenetics, particularly complex karyotype cytogenetics. So, so that, that is a variable that is seen not infrequently that, that confounds P53 biallelic hit status. Um, this, again, is... is uh, uh, from a paper that uh, was published by Bernard and colleagues in Nature Medicine in 2020, again, showing that uh, P53 allelic states uh, uh, demarcates outcomes even in therapy-related MDS. So not just in de novo MDS, but also in therapy-related MDS. Fast forward a little bit to what uh, Dr. Garcia Minero kind of really uh, set the stage for, and that is the, the introduction of IPSSM, the, the IPSS version that incorporates as a prognostic model predictors of poor and favorable outcomes that incorporates mutational uh, data within its, its uh, framework. So. Um, uh, unlike IPSSR, IPSSM incorporates gene mutations as well as hematologic and cytogenetic parameters. It was a scheme that was developed uh, with really a very large uh, cohort on, on the basis of analysis of a large cohort of MDS patients. Now, the top predictors of adverse outcomes in IPSSM are, again, uh, multi-hit P53 mutations, FLT3 mutations in MDS, and KMT2A uh, PTD, tandem duplications. Uh, in comparison to IPSSR, uh, IPSSM improves prognostication. Uh, it really um, uh, takes uh, parameters that have been included in IPSSR, but adds to them the mutation profile so that on balance, many patients can be or, or may be up 
uh, upstaged in terms of their risk stratifier based on, on their mutational findings. This is how the, MD, uh, the IPSSM uh, prognostic tool looks like. It's, it's available online. You can actually uh, visit this uh, website, mdsriskmodel.com, with all the, the detailed syntax that you can see on the, on the screen. And you can see that there is an element of uh, patient data where the, the blast count is, is considered, as well as the degree of cytopenias with hemoglobin, platelets, and absolute neutrophil count. And there's, of course, uh, age that, that plays an important role in, in, in setting the, the risk uh, stratum for the patient. Uh, and, then, and this is uh, then followed by patient data based on cytogenetics. And so cytogenetic categories, again, uh, ranging from very good all the way to very poor, are defined on the website, and, and one can view them and, and apply the, the appropriate category for the patient. And then here is, of course, where IPSSM adds, adds in this, the value of mutation uh, profiling data as being a component of, of IPSM. And, and you can see the, the genes in question that impact risk stratification. And um, you can, one can enter them and, and calculate the risk and view where the patient's risk score is on, on something that looks a bit like this, uh, where one can go from very low to very high risk MDS. Uh, this uh, really kind of uh, can be further enhanced if one has information about loss of heterozygosity at the p53 locus. This would be the locus that's not impacted by, by the mutation. Uh, I will not go into, into too much uh, of these details, but suffice it to say that this is a component of IPSSM that can add further uh, specificity to the risk stratification process. In my remaining uh, few minutes, uh, the take home um, uh, in terms of messages on, on baseline MDS assessment is that one, MDS diagnosis should rest on standardized criteria that incorporate morphologic dysplasia, cytopenias, morphologic profiling, and cytogenetics. I think here um, it's important to keep in mind that classification of MDS is one thing and prognostication of MDS is another thing. There's a lot of overlap, but I think in our minds they should, they should remain as two distinct facets of this disease. And uh, of course, uh, not, not something new and not something uh, that's, that's been missed to this audience, and that is that mutation profiling provides actionable treatment and risk stratification data as one sees most recently integrated in IPSM. IPSSM. So thank you, and uh, I'll pass the stage now to my colleague, Dr. Shesitri. Thank you so much, Dr. Kuri. That was a very comprehensive <laughs> thank you. So taking this forward, uh, we're actually going to talk about low-risk MDS. And before we launch into the topic, we're going to discuss a case. So Stephen is a 73-year-old man presenting to primary care with fatigue, pallor, shortness of breath. His initial test confirms anemia, as we can see from the hemoglobin. After additional evaluation is referred to hematology oncology, it looks like the preliminary tests, uh, the vitamin B12 folate iron levels are normal. The blood smear shows macrocytosis with dimorphic RBCs. Um, so additional recommendations is early prompt evaluation and robust baseline testing. So once we tested him with um, NGS profiling, bone marrow biopsy, and everything, as Dr. Khoury explained so beautifully, we do see that he has an SF3B1 mutation with 35% ring sideroblasts, 4% bone marrow blasts. Does this give you enough information to calculate the prognosis? In this particular situation, what do you feel? Do you think that having just this information 
uh, about the mutation, SF3B1, and the percentage ring sideroblast is enough to give you information about the prognosis? Well, I would say in this case, since we have information about SF3B1 mutation, it is really sufficient to, based on the criteria that we have, to classify the patient as having MDS with SF3B1 mutation. And that by itself would be very important in terms of what, how to manage the patient. Yeah, I would tend to agree. This gives us a good amount of information and we can so actually... So you don't think that the cytogenetics will add? Cytogenetics, I think, will add value, but um, we, we'll see what, what we find out. Most patients with this level of blasts and with SF3B1 mutation uh, being in the background tend to have deployed cytogenetics or, or would have at least, uh, would not have high risk cytogenetics the vast majority of them. And hence the, the findings by Malkovadi and, and colleagues that, that show that SF3B1 <laughs> is typically associated with this favorable background. What if Stephen has a different presentation? So if, instead of SF3B1, we're now looking at TP53 mutation with a complex karyotype. Um, and in this alternate scenario, how do you feel the IPSSM measures up with the IPSSR for evaluating high-risk disease? Any thoughts about that, Dr. Khoury? Uh, well, well, here we're, we're dealing with uh, definitely the identification of a P53 mutation should prompt us to always think of high-risk disease. Uh, certainly having poor cytogenetics is not infrequently associated with, with uh, multiple hits to the P53 gene or a mutation associated with loss of heterozygosity. So, so uh, this definitely presents, I think, a very different type of disease to the treating oncologist. Yes, absolutely, yeah. This tells us we're dealing with definitely a more aggressive type of disease. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, my name is Aditi Shastri, and I will be talking to you about low-risk MDS uh, and therapeutic options for the same. So as uh, Dr. Khoury beautifully explained to us, we have multiple systems by which we could prognosticate our patients with MDS. We have the IPSS, the IPSSR, now we have the IPSSM, where typically our patients with lower risk MDS fall into the very low, low, or the moderately low risk profile. And uh, these are patients that have a bone marrow blast percentage of less than 10%. And therapies that we look at in the first line for our patients are growth factors, chelation, Luspatercept, hypomethylating agents, lenalidomide, immunomodulation in select cases like we talked about with the hypoplastic MDS, and where we deem it necessary clinical trials. So I'm going to try to walk us through some of these treatments, and then we will talk about higher risk MDS. And then in some cases where we need to, after we've gone through many therapies, we really do need to evaluate these patients clinically for allogeneic stem cell transplant too, once they have progression of disease. So that's just something to keep in mind as well. So DNA methyltransferase inhibitors, such as our hypomethylating agents like azacitidine, and decidabine are time-tested. I know Dr. Garcia Manero walked us to a timeline, and when I was looking at it, it's unbelievable that it's 20 years that we've been talking about these drugs. But uh, aza these drugs have stood the test of time, and azacitidine, we know for many years, you know, as well as dacogen, is the backbone, really, of disease-modifying treatment, is associated with the survival benefit in myelodysplastic syndromes. Uh, we have a relative newcomer, which is our oral combination of decidabine and sedazuridin. 
And sedazuridin, we will talk about it a little more, is a novel and efficacious inhibitor of cytidine deaminase, which allows the improved oral bioavailability of decidabine. And uh, this allows our patients a more convenient oral option as well, in addition to injectable hypomethylating agents, and definitely has comparable median OS and has a tolerable side effect profile. So not to belabor the point, but just again, sedazuridin, as I said, is a cytidine deaminase inhibitor and effectively is able to inactivate the cytidine deaminase in the gut. And when given orally with dacogen, it enables much more efficient oral bioavailability. Anemia is a problem that we, all of us that treat MDS in the clinic, we know well is something we face as a primary issue with patients with low risk MDS. And uh, we have to address this problem as the patients come to see us. Some of the strategies that we use frontline are the ESAs or, or the erythropoietin stimulating agents. Although this has been part of our treatment guidelines and we use it, it is still not FDA approved in the United States for MDS treatment. One of the caveats to this is I know it's very often we see that, oh, people are being treated with these ESAs and then they move on quickly to other uh, drugs. But one thing to keep in mind is sometimes you need to scale up the dose. You have to go up on the dose to make sure you're giving the highest possible dose that the patient can tolerate uh, before you move on. And then, you know, of course, there is loss of efficacy over time, and some have a longer duration of response to it than others. RBC transfusions, of course, are a cornerstone of treating anemia, but this is more a stopgap, right? Because this increases the burden on the patient of infections, transfusion dependencies causing iron overload, and increased risk of AML transformation. And in this context, we have to also keep in mind that using these ESAs and achieving hematologic improvement with them and improved erythroid profile can result in improved or superior overall survival for the patients as well. So just again quickly, I won't go through this in detail, but of course ESAs, as we know, epoetin alpha, darbopoietin, the recombinant human erythropoietin can improve anemia, need for transfusions, improve quality of life. In those patients that have an inadequate response, and in this context, I would like to highlight that patients with ringed sideroblasts can have a response as quickly as other patients, but the response wears off faster. Uh, in these cases, you could potentially combine the ESAs with myeloid growth factors, which is a good option for the patients in the outpatient setting. And as we said, it is good to optimally titrate the dose of the ESA to make sure that the patient is getting the maximum benefit from it before we altogether give up on it. So ESA resistance and, you know, is a patient really responding to the ESA is something that we are always assessing and reassessing in the clinic. And one of the important things is why do patients relapse or not stop responding? It is because there is loss of sensitivity of the erythroid progenitors. And not just that, they have lesser blast forming units or they have lesser progenitors in general. Both these factors contribute to therapy resistance. And the median duration of response is typically 18 to 24 months. The Nord, we do have a Nordic scoring system to kind of predict the response to ESA-based therapies in MDS patients. And people do find this helpful when they're making a decision about uh, whether to give offer a patient ESA therapy or not. The main features of the score rely on looking at your serum EPO level as well as the transfusion dependency of the patient. And based on this, if they do get a good score, which is plus one, that means they have a good chance of responding to the therapy versus if not. But even, I mean, just looking at the score, you can see that if somebody already has a high serum EPO level and has a high transfusion burden, the chances that they will respond to ESAs are pretty poor. So that may make you want to look at other things already.
So what do we actually, what are the recommendations uh, in the guidelines about what options we have after ESA failures? And as we said, that these group of patients that don't really, we're going to talk only about the ones that don't have deletion 5Q with ring sideroblasts, you know, or of more than 15% or more than 5% with NSF3B1 mutations could respond to the ESAs, but then they could lose response faster. If you still have a low serum EPO level, you could challenge them with different type of ESA, like recombinant human erythropoietin with GCSF, darbopoietin alpha, and then you move on to lucepatercept if you see no response, and we can talk about that in a bit. If you have a high serum EPO level already, you can consider lucepatercept, and then lenalidomide down the line. So lucepatercept, and again, Dr. Garcia Monero highlighted uh, the recent FDA approval of this drug, and it is a very novel drug with a novel mechanism. It is a fusion protein that contains this activin receptor, which is a member of the transforming growth factor beta superfamily with the FC portion of a human IgG1. And typically, the TGF beta signaling and is upregulated in patients with low risk MDS, which causes arrest of late stage erythropoiesis. And some of these uh, signals include SMAD2, SMAD3, and the loose pattern sept, uh, the ligand, uh, the activin receptor arm acts as a ligand trap. So it actually traps some of these ligands which cause this upregulation of signaling and inflammation and it inhibits the SMAD2, SMAD3 signaling and traps some of these other ligands as well and hence releases this blockage on late stage erythroid production and stimulates RBC production. So we have the data from the Medalist study which was uh, which we already have it uh, published, where we saw that there was a substantial reduction in the transfusion burden for patients with lucepatercept. The study was specifically enriched for those patients with ring sideroblasts that, as Dr. Khoury mentioned, they strongly overlap with the group that have SF3B1 mutations. And a very recently updated publication, uh, which shows a more longer-term follow-up, does show that across the groups, whether they are low transfusion burden or high transfusion burden, there continue to be benefits after median follow-up of 26 months, specifically this group of patients with a low transfusion burden really have a good benefit from being treated with lucepatercept. So just a quick update that is going to be presented at ASH and you know you have an opportunity to see this poster on Saturday is that although this is uh, you know looking a further analysis really of the medalist study because as it wasn't really powered to assess the overall survival or progression free survival it does appear, like I mentioned, that especially for these groups of patients which are very low risk or more, more on the lower end of the lower risk spectrum, we can say, is associated, a treatment is associated with a higher chance of an overall survival probability. Um, and so you could actually look at this poster as well so across the studies that have been done with loose patercept, whether it was the phase two, the PACE, or the medalist, it does appear to be a well-tolerated option. Some of the adverse events that patients complain of in clinic are fatigue, diarrhea, malaise, nausea, and I've definitely encountered them as well. And sometimes it's a little bit of titrating the symptoms. Um, and if it's abs obviously, if it's absolutely intolerable, you may have to give the patient a break off treatment, but generally they are manageable. So the phase three commands trial is actually looking at lucepatercept head to head with uh, erythropoietin stimulating agents, in this case, epoietin alpha. And in this study, patients that are actually ESA naive with low risk MDS, 
uh, and our transfusion dependent will be randomized to getting frontline Luspatercept versus the ESA, and the primary endpoint we're looking at is RBC transfusion independence for 12 weeks within the first 24 weeks, with an increase in the hemoglobin 1.5 grams per deciliter over the baseline. So lenalidomide, as we know, is also another drug that has been around for over a decade now and is uh, used and is approved for managing patients with low intermediate risk uh, deletion 5Q my MDS with or without additional cytogenetic abnormalities. And it's a complex slide, but I will just say that, you know, these patients have a very excellent response of somewhere between 55 to 67 percent when they're given lenalidomide, specifically the DEL5Q subset. Uh, this is a quick, this is a nice study being presented at ASH this year. It's an oral abstract, which is from the Spanish group. This is the Sintra Rev study, which is a phase three multicenter study in low risk MDS with deletion 5Q patients with anemia, but without transfusion dependence and a lower dose than what we typically use. Uh, we used 10, but here five milligrams per day continuously versus placebo was used, and patients had two years on treatment, followed by two more years of follow-up, and uh, very interestingly, this actually does show that the low-risk, low-dose lenalidomide does prolong the time to transfusion dependency uh, and it improves the hemoglobin levels and also really causes uh, improvement in the mutational profile for the patients that are not transfusion dependent. There is also an accompanying poster to this trial actually which shows that the mutation burden has improved in a way that it is specific to the mutations for MDS like SF3B1, TP53, while those mutations that are more associated with clonal hematopoiesis like TET2 or DNMT3A are not much affected, so I think I would tend to agree with Dr. Garcia Manero that really treating our patients earlier than we usually used to looks like definitely has some benefit uh, for them. And this is an interesting area that we need to look at much more in the coming years. So newer mechanisms, and uh, we'll try to go through this quickly. So this is a very interesting drug. I'm a Telstat, and as we know, telomerase has been the culprit uh, uh, across several different cancers, and including in MDS. We do see that as a result of malignant cells upregulating the enzyme telomerase, uh, this causes shortened telomeres and uh, uh, and in this case, it causes, uh, it, it, it basically kind of uh, allows these cells to multiply, but this particularly targets these malignant cells with upregulated telomerase and causes apoptosis and allows the recovery of normal hematopoiesis. And it is being looked at across a few different diseases, including myelofibrosis and MDS now with the ring sideroblasts. So this was a study which was previously presented, the iMERGE phase two portion, testing imetelstat in low risk MDS. And uh, here, patients that were RBC transfusion dependent or ESA relapsed refractory low risk patients, 57 were studied and it did look like, it looked very promising, the imetelstat induced a meaningful uh, transfusion independence, which was durable across a broad range of patients with low risk MDS that were already heavily pretreated and re relapsed refractory or ineligible to ESAs. Going further, so this is another oral abstract which I wanted to highlight. It's going to be presented this Sunday at ASH. And uh, here we actually have an update from the study that in this heavily, heavily pretreated and transfused group of patients with non-deletion 5Q low risk MDS, <laughs> treatment with, the, with the imetelstat achieved a more, year one, more than one year sustained continuous transfusion independence in 29% of this heavily pretreated group. Uh, and in the overall population, attaining 24-week transfusion independence was actually already indicative of getting transfusion independent at one year, so this served as a good marker for those that would respond.
respond from the therapy. So this is just a schema of the phase three trial that is for ongoing and will evaluate imatel stat in low risk MDS. So here are patients that are non-deletion 5Q, transfusion dependent, a relapse refractory to ASAs will be randomized to imatelstat 7.5 mg per kg weekly versus placebo with a, looking at the primary endpoint of RBC transfusion independence with multiple other secondary endpoints. Um, as you can see on the slide, I won't read through it. So I just have a few take home messages uh, just to recap what I said. So uh, DNA methyltransferase inhibitors or hypomethylating agents have stood the test of time and they continue to remain the backbone of disease modifying therapy in MDS. I do think oral HMAs is a really nice thing for our patients. It does give them more convenience to be able to take something that's injectable orally for very similar benefit. <laughs> Erythropoietin stimulating agents definitely improve anemia, quality of life, uh, and transfusion burden, which could translate into an overall survival benefit. It's very important to remember to optimize the therapy and dosage of these drugs before we say, let's move on. Uh, Luspatercept is an FDA-approved option for lower-risk patients with ringed sideroblasts, or this MDS-MPN overlap syndrome with ring sideroblasts and thrombocytosis, uh, especially for those patients that fail or are now refractory or ineligible to ESAs and, require, and are transfusion dependent. And imatel stat that we highlighted targeting telomerase has promising activity in low-risk MDS and is further being investigated in a phase three study. So Stephen, our 70-year-old patient now, has a confirmed case of MDS with ringed sideroblasts and SF3B1 mutation, 35% ringed sideroblasts, no DEL5Q, his EPO level is 450, his hemoglobin is 8.6, and the treatments that are recommended here are ESA, recombinant human EPO, plus or minus GCSF, and RBC transfusions. So what do you feel about this recommendation? Do you think this is the current step? And how long do you think we should wait until we assess the response to ESA therapy? So this is interesting uh, case, Dr. Shastri, because I don't know if the patient is transfusion dependent or independent, but let's assume that this patient is transfusion dependent. And actually, this is something that maybe is not known by the whole audience, but actually, Luspatercept could be indicated in this particular context. So. This patient has a ring seroblastic anemia, has an SF3B1 mutation, and the detail actually is that it has a high EPO level. So actually the label will allow you to prescribe this uh, uh, agent in first line uh, therapy as opposed to an ESA based on this concept that this patient has a, a low likelihood of, uh, of responding to ESAs. That said, there are no comparative studies that I'm aware of comparing an ESA versus loose patterns except in this particular context. But we also heard that the uh, press release from the COMMANDS trial is uh, 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 positive, although you know, we don't know the data in, uh, in total detail. So I think you could do kind of like the standard of care ESA. I don't think that in North America we use uh, myeloid growth factors at all uh, for a number of reasons. And I think a new compound loose patterns could be probably what I will do in my center for this particular patient. What do you think, Dr. Shastri? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think luspatercept would be a very, it would definitely be an option here and something we would have a discussion with the patient about ESA and luspatercept. And I agree with you, the chance of them responding to luspatercept is very high given this mutational and uh, pathologic profile. But then the question is, let's say if you go back, if uh, uh, this patient was started on ESA, that will probably also be the right thing uh, to do with or without the GCSF, for how long would you uh, wait until switching to, because then, you know, this obviously if this patient fails this therapy, then uh, he will be candidate for loose patterns in second line. So what do you think about that? Will it make sense to sequence and for how long do you wait for uh, these ESAs to quote unquote fail? Yeah, that's a good point. So like we said, you know, the ESAs don't work overnight. They definitely take more time to work. And uh, we, as long as the patient is tolerating the ESA and 
Uh, we are not seeing a significant clinical decline, you know, that the hemoglobin is remaining kind of where it is, and we're able to kind of uh, transfuse them to support them, but the transfusion requirement is not going on. Uh, increasing, I typically give the patients several weeks to respond to the ESA, uh, and uh, maybe up to sometimes, you know, 18 to maybe 24 weeks just to respond to the ESAs before we discuss other therapeutic options. So now it looks like the decision was made for our patient with MDS and ring sideroblast to be treated with the ESAs. RBC transfusions were initiated after the ESA therapy, and after 14 months of treatment, now we're seeing an increase in transfusion requirement. Now we're seeing the patient is getting three units per month. Given this development, do we actually think now that he is ESA refractory? If so, then what do we do? So there's a host of options we have been offered. What do you feel, Dr. Garcia Manero? Where do I mean, you think he's ESA refractory? I mean, this is what the medalist uh, uh, supports, right? That was presented in a New England Journal paper. You know, it shows that there is. Uh, uh, an improvement in terms of transfusion dependency compared to placebo in, in this situation. So I likely uh, proceed with that approach. The patient does not have a DEL5Q alteration, so I'm not sure that I will be using lenalidomide in that context. And I think uh, hypomethylating agents in general probably are reserved for people with a little bit more advanced disease, let's say maybe by cytopenia, you know, significant thrombocytopenia, something like that. So I think I will switch on to loose patterns in this concept in this context. Yeah, I tend to agree. This patient definitely seems to have had a good run with the ESAs, 14 months, but now the transfusion requirements are going up, which is the normal progression of the disease, and we would definitely offer lucepatercept with the ring sideroblast. This is the appropriate indication for the drug. So we're going to finish this with the high-risk uh, uh, part of, of, of the talk. Uh, of course, in the red box, you see that by the way, Dr. Hurry was very humble because he didn't mention that he is the first author and the lead of this uh, uh, WHO classification, so it was a really privilege to, to have you with, with us. So the bottom line is, I don't know if next year we have a similar symposium or someone else does it, what we're going to be talking about in terms of what is high-risk uh, uh, disease. Uh, of course, I think this molecular architecture of the disease is very important. I think there was this case early on, maybe low blast, but P53, high complexity in terms of cytogenetics. That's going to be interesting. But, you know, let's say you have the IPSS, IPSSR uh, definition. You know, by the IPSSM will be like the three top uh, uh, subgroups that will be considered uh, higher risk. Automatic definition, 10% blast. We just heard this issue with this ICC. Uh, but the bottom line is most of us probably still are functioning around IPSS, IPSSR, if we are sophisticated. Many places, many countries don't really have systematic use of NGS. So then the next question is, I think now starting to think about what is your final goal? Can this patient go for curative approach, meaning like a stem cell transplant? And therefore, if you think that's the way to go, you know, how do you achieve that? So the first question is, what is the age of the patient? And I think this is also kind of like changing. I remember the first time I built the slides, maybe 10, 15 years ago, actually it was like 60, and then it moved like 65, now we're in the 70s, 75. So this is like maybe changing as I also age myself, so maybe I'm preparing myself for, for this. And then the question is, what do we do? Is this gonna be kind of like a low intensity approach with a hypomethylating agent, or should we just go and induce uh, this patient with some type of AML-like approach and then go to transplant? I actually, and I'm going to go a couple of steps ahead uh, with some of the questions that I'm going to come to Dr. Corey. That is, I think the issue with these classifications when it comes to WHO ICC is that some in colleagues have equated uh, outcomes with nosology, meaning, you know, you have whatever outcome, that means that you have some disease. But I don't know that's biology. That's like a practicality. So I see kind of like the practical angle of that. But the reality is that I think we treat biological entities, diseases, and they have some characteristics. And, um, and I think where some of this kind of quote-unquote confusion is coming, and I really support the WHO uh, effort because it still is our framework for, for many years. But that said, we'll see at the end what uh, uh, prevails. The other thing that is happening, and I, uh, I saw my colleague Dr. Kornblau entering uh, uh, an hour ago, so he's going to be shocked by this because he's a bone marrow transplant doctor at MD Anderson, that is, 
you know, when we were approaching our patients maybe a few years ago, you know, transplant was not in our radar, actually. We didn't think that that was kind of relevant, and very few of our patients could get there. The toxicity was, like, brutal, relapse was high. And the reality is that over the last 10 years, actually, we've seen a systematic and chronic improvement in transplant outcomes. And this is actually illustrated in this patient here by what I call the IBMTR. I think they, they changed their acronym. But this is really interesting data, right? This is on kind of like donor, no donor type of analysis, so it's not a perfect type of study, but it's really telling you that we are starting to transplant more. And if you look at the prior version of uh, this paper, actually, uh, the outcomes are significantly better than what we had uh, in the JCO 10 years ago. So this is actually starting to open the door to this concept that you're going to hear more and more of total therapy in MDS, that is, okay, can I take this patient to a stem cell transplant, and then if so, what do I do before, and maybe for those patients that have such a high rate of relapse post-transplant, like P53 mutated disease, can I do something afterwards, and then maybe try to improve, uh, if not you know, cure that may be a difficult goal right now, but maybe start improving uh, outcomes. So this is actually important. In my center, for instance, we're starting to transplant people mid-70s, if they have a donor, if they are in good shape, etc. And then, particularly in the uh, United States, where, you know, we have some uh, diversity issues, etc., you know, now we have a better pool of donors. So I think at the end, we're really able to start offering this uh, more frequently and more effectively and more safely to, to, to our patients. So that's something that we have never done, starting a talk on high-risk uh, malodysplastic syndrome. And um, so basically, you know, you start like that. Is this patient candidate for transplant or not? What is the age? And, and, and again, how do you do this kind of bridging uh, approach to the patient? So the standard of care is a single agent hypomethylating agent, such as esacitadine. I'm not going to spend like the few minutes that we have left uh, discussing this. I think it's more interesting perhaps to start discussing some of these quote unquote doublets that uh, we, I think we're almost kind of in the finish line, hopefully in the next one or two years, we'll have some answers from these uh, very nice mm -hmm. studies. So let's start uh, reviewing first uh, uh, this uh, relatively new form of immunotherapy using an antibody against CD47. So it's actually a really interesting uh, concept, right? Because even in myeloid malignancies, we were looking at PD-1, CTLA-4 inhibitors, combinations, things like that. And then, you know, this group at uh, Stanford by uh, Dr. Weisman and uh, Ravi Majetti, you know, came with this kind of interaction between this molecule uh, CD47 and basically the ability of these macrophages to go and eradicate uh, uh, these malignant and clones. And basically, this is so-called do not eat me signal that is inactivating the phagocytic activity of, of, of these cells. And by introducing an antibody targeting CD47, you basically unblock this process and then you allow uh, these bad cells to be uh, eradicated. I just treat patients with MDS and AML, but I can also imagine that this kind of intervention may have a role in other diseases. I think there are studies basically in other uh, malignancies because this, in principle, should be agnostic of, of the type of disease, I would think. So this has been really innovative and, and, and transformative uh, concept. You know, the first phase of these studies were done actually in the UK, at, in Oxford, and then they moved quickly to the uh, uh, United States. And then we started to see these really uh, very significant uh, uh, responses with this combination of esacitadine and this uh, anti-CD47 antibody known as uh, uh, magrolimab. That's also a very interesting thing, that is, you need some priming. So probably this kind of molecules will have very little activity as a single agent, meaning just antibody uh, alone. They need the push, and you know, why this happens is uh, an area of, of discussion, of uh, being combined, in this case, with a hypomethylating agent that, uh, in this case, is esacitadine that is being tested as the backbone in many of the other clinical trials. So this is uh, data from a study that has been now presented uh, uh, several times from the original phase 1b study of ASA plus uh, uh, magrolimab. And here we're looking at patients with untreated high-risk uh, uh, malodysplastic syndrome. And then if you are looking at the table, you see quickly that we are separating these patients into those that are P53 mutated versus those that are wild type. This is another very interesting concept because in principle, if you think about it, there's no real reason why macrophage should kill more or less or eat more or less a P53 mutated cell versus some other uh, cell. So there's this idea that perhaps this is an agnostic type of intervention against those patients with P53 uh, mutated disease. So you're going to see this uh, quite a bit as this uh, type of combination gets developed. So the overall response rate here is around 74 to 78%. Uh, 
you know, around a third, a little bit more of these patients achieve like true uh, complete uh, uh, remissions. And what you see actually is that as opposed to other type of combinations or single agents, actually it seems that those patients with P53 uh, mutated uh, do uh, well in terms of overall response and, and, uh, uh, and their complete remission rates that actually is around uh, 40%. So this is, of course, exciting data. These are high numbers in terms of overall response rate, complete remission rates, and particularly focusing in these like 25 patients in this study with TP53 uh, mutated uh, uh, disease. Now, how does this translate to survival? Of course, these are you know, not really gigantic studies. They're not randomized, of course. This is phase one study. But here, you know, the median survival has not been reached. And this population is really uh, uh, enriched. That's a redundancy for uh, this cohort of patients with P53 uh, mutated uh, uh, disease. Now, when you look on, 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 on your right, you see that there's also a separation of those uh, lines in terms of those that were wild type for P53 and those that were not, uh, 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 that were P53 mutated. But if you look at the blue line, that is the P53 mutated one, the survival is around median 16 months. That is actually much better than the 11 months that we show with the APR data or with the single agent hypomethylating agent. So this is very interesting and it's gonna be really important to see how we evolved uh, with this type of combinations, particularly because we need therapies for those uh, P53 uh, mutated uh, uh, patients. There is actually an update of uh, 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 this study uh, in one of these abstracts. This is uh, what you see here. And this is actually very interesting in my opinion because it's really measuring actually what happens to the amount of mutation, what we refer to as a BIF, on those patients treated on this study. So this is kind of like a sequential analysis of the molecular burden. And this is something that Dr. Hurry didn't really touch because of time and it was not really the topic, but I think this is actually fundamental in our practice. Not, not only you have to have those NGS panels upfront, but also through the course of therapy, because that goes back to this issue of total therapy, what is the right time of transplant, and what do I do with a patient with this kind of mutation? What is the optimal time of, of uh, transplantation, for instance? You know, we don't have that data, but I would think that if someone is at the lowest BAF possible, that may perhaps will be the optimal point. And what this abstract suggests is that indeed there is a significant decrease in the molecular burden of this mutation, meaning actually that these individuals are really achieving a molecular responses. So this is really interesting and really data supporting the activity of this combo in P53 uh, mutated uh, disease. Now, I think the community is very familiar using this drug. We saw the results from the Panther trial, where now in a worldwide study, CR rates are 30%, and people know how to give isocytadine, uh, so that's good. So the question is, do you get a lot more toxicity uh, from this type of combination? So when you look at this kind of from like a high view, you see the typical type of uh, toxicities that you see with an HMA, cytopenia, et cetera. You don't see actually a lot of immune-related reactions. If some of you are familiar or have used nivolumab, pipilumumab, et cetera, you are familiar with these uh, you know, inflammatory complications. We don't really see this with uh, uh, this particular compound, but this is a very specific uh, um, issue that you will uh, see if you have not used this compound on a clinical trial. That is this kind of hemolytic anemia that you can see early in the course of Therapy. Actually, the basis of this is well understood. It's something related to kind of like the structure of the red cells and the presence of antigens. So actually, through this priming uh, process that is shown here, kind of like making sure that those patients are not really anemic when they start therapy, starting with kind of like a priming dose of the uh, antibody, you actually mitigate this, and this is actually something that is very easy to, to take in clinical practice, but you need to be aware because if you don't do that and you just treat a patient like that, you may run into complications from uh, severe anemia with uh, uh, this drug. And the reality is that you know, we're all uh, waiting for the results of this very important study known as the ENHANCE study. So this, to my knowledge, I believe, has uh, basically reached uh, uh, its accrual. This is really fundamental randomized study comparing single agent esacitadine versus the combination of ASA and magrolimab with an uh, endpoint of response, but also of overall survival. And this could be actually one of the fundamental studies that guide our therapy uh, uh, approaches in the years uh, uh, to come. Now, there are other immune uh, therapeutic approaches. Some of them are actually are gonna be reported here by uh, Dr. Santini, Dr. Saidan, basically talking about this antibody against TIM3 known as sabatolimab. So we will see actually what these outcomes are in those oral uh, presentations. And just to mention quickly that people are very fast in developing second class or second generation type of compounds. So this already, there are multiple, but as an example, there's already uh, a drug that also targets CD47 known as Ivorparcept, 
that uh, uh, apparently has less of this chemolytic anemia that is also being tested both in myelodysplastic syndrome and in acute uh, myelogenous uh, leukemia. Now, the other doublet of great uh, interest will be, of course, the combination with uh, the BCL2 inhibitor, uh, Benetoclax. I think the audience is probably very familiar with this combo because this is now a standard of care in acute myelogenous leukemia. So this is the Viale study, as a cytidine plus Benetoclax. And then the question is, how does this look in uh, patients with a high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome? Before I start here, like, don't know this is universal. I don't think this happens in Argentina. I'm not sure. I was there a month ago. I don't remember what you told me, Marcelo. But the bottom line is, in the United States, I see patients that have MDS, not AML, that receive Benetoclax, and I sometimes see them with 28-day high dose uh, Benetoclax. This probably is not the way to use this compound. You may want to go down to like maybe 14 days, maybe less. So that's something that I see in the United States happening in community, you know, translating directly. Maybe the dose is not the same, and that's why it's so important to do the studies. But uh, this combination has been uh, studied in quite a bit of detail in uh, high-risk myelodysplastic syndrome. This is the presentation by Dr. Jackie Garcia from Dana Farber uh, uh, last year at ASH, kind of summarizing the response rates uh, with this combo. And you see kind of similar data to what I showed you with Magrolimab a couple of minutes ago. So overall response rate around 84%, a CR rate of around 35%. Now, there is a question of, um, cytopenias and, and toxicity. I'm going to show you, uh, show you a couple of examples very uh, quickly. But what you see there actually is that the time of response is quick. It's actually less than one month. And actually, these responses are quite uh, durable. Right now, with whatever follow-up we have, is close to uh, 13 months. Something that I think is really fundamental, and this is actually how we practice in my center. It's actually, and again, taken from bial experience, is looking at the molecular characteristics of these patients. And I think in the future, this could be kind of a discriminatory tool that you may use to decide who takes this doublet versus another doublet, because we're starting to see differences in response and outcomes based on particular mutations. And for instance, there are things that I don't know how to interpret. You know, we have this dogma that P53 is really a bad thing to do with this kind of doublet. But if I interpret the response, there is like 85%. Now, they don't last, OK? And probably the BAF is not touched. But if you didn't have magrolimab, would you do a doublet like this, taking a patient to transplant? I don't know. So perhaps we can discuss this later. There's a fraction of patients with IDH1 and IDH2 mutations. They are not represented here, but they are in other studies. And they have a very high rate of uh, uh, responses with this type of doublet. So I think that perhaps different mutations will have uh, significant differences in responses and outcomes with any of these uh, doublets. What about the safety profile? I mean, again, this is like we mentioned with uh, the Magrolimab, in general, well tolerated, but this is going to give you cytopenia in a way, basically something that you have probably experienced with uh, uh, your patients with uh, uh, AML that you treated like in the Viale uh, experience. Now, that said, even if you have the cytopenia, fibra, neutropenia, et cetera, the mortality rate, if these patients receive prophylactic antibiotics, if you follow in the clinic, if you admit them to the hospital when needed, it's actually close to 0%. So there are some people out there saying, oh, this is toxic. Well, it's toxic if you just do it at lip and you don't really treat the patients and support them as they probably uh, need. So I think that this is really a uh, satisfactory uh, combination. So this is a phase one trial, has not been published, but is there additional data? So we just published a few months ago in Lancet Hematology our experience with a prospective phase one trial of the combination of A7 Etoclax at MD Anderson. And what you see here is that the overall response rate is 87%. So this is um, similar to what I just showed you from the phase one uh, study uh, a couple of minutes ago. Now, if you are not thinking about Brazil and Argentina and looking at the slide, you see that the CR rate here is like 13, so it's lower. And this actually goes back to an issue that perhaps we can address a little bit later, that is how we measure responses. You know, there's a new classification coming that may actually remove uh, marrow CR, so all this is also in, in change, and it relates to the degree of cytopenia, the duration of those cytopenias. So we may be in a situation where, you know, either we just focus on CR or we redefine it or we look at these overall uh, response rates. But the bottom line is that in the front line, we have two data sets that give us really nice uh, uh, overall response rates, again, over 80%. That is significantly higher than what you will expect from a single agent as a cytadine. The follow-up of this particular study is not that long. But as you see, they're similar to uh, the study of Jackie Garcia. There is no median survival. So this is all pointing towards the right direction that is hopefully possible that this kind of doublet will improve also the survival of these patients, similar to what we just saw with uh, the Magrolimab uh, uh, doublet. And again, 
I can say whatever I think, but the reality is that the answer will be on the study. This is also a study that finished accrual a few months ago, really fundamental trial known as the Verona trial. Uh, the study randomizing is associated in with or without uh, uh, Benetoclax. Uh, this was actually a blinded study, as opposed to uh, the enhanced study where you, know, you couldn't really do that. There is a little detail on this study, the Verona, as opposed to the enhanced, is that the study actually excluded patients with therapy-related myelodysplastic syndrome. So some of these patients with P53 mutated disease and so forth were probably not part of, of this study and perhaps uh, are enriched in the enhanced study that was open in many centers, at least in the United States, in, in parallel. So we have to see how that affects actually uh, uh, the results, responses, and, and overall survival of, of these studies. Now, these are very well, both of them, very well designed studies with over 500 patients with a goal basically of demonstrating an improvement in overall uh, 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 survival. I actually hope that both of them get uh, a positive signal and that uh, a few years ago from now we are talking about triplets and things like that. I think perhaps we will start talking about uh, curing some of these patients. Now, this is actually th something that is uh, very important and, uh, and I think is critical. So the reality is that uh, enhanced, we're waiting, um, Verona, we're waiting. Uh, there's another third study with this uh, retinoic acid receptor alpha inhibitor also uh, ongoing. But, uh, you know, right now you have either chemotherapy or a hypomethylating agent, single agent, and the question is, can you do a little bit better? And Dr. Corey had a beautiful slide looking at these uh, mutations as diagnostic, uh, therapeutic, etc. Please don't forget about the therapeutic angle of these mutations. Now, what I'm going to say probably is kind of off label, so I don't know how that works out, but you know, the reality is that we're here to help our patients. So, around 5 to 10% of our patients with MDS have an IDH2 mutation. And uh, there's actually significant data published in top tier journals indicating a very high rate of response uh, using uh, uh, IDH2 inhibitors with or without a hypomethylating agent. And if you don't have access to that, these patients actually have very significant sensitivity to venetoclax. So, you know, there is an angle there that perhaps could uh, improve on the uh, outcomes of single agent uh, uh, hypomethylating agent. IDH1 is not that frequent, it's significantly lower, let's say less than 5%. But it's the same concept. So there are drugs that inhibit uh, this mutation. BCL2 inhibitors will also have a significant role. Now, today, we have not talked about relapsed refractory. We don't really have time to do that. But just to mention that um, there's a subset of these patients that when they relapse, they acquire actually a mutation on FLIP3. And they are still in this context of 10% blast. I don't know how they will call them. Probably they'll switch their name to AML or something like that. But the reality is, if you don't do genomics, you will miss that. And then you may miss an opportunity actually for very effective therapeutics, adding back a flitter inhibitor to an HMA. And then this is an anecdote, the bottom one with MPN1, but this is very dear to my heart because it starts with some patient that I saw in my clinic like around 10 years ago, young woman who traveled all the way from India to be treated by us. And I'm thinking, mm, why should I give this lady who traveled, you know, whatever many hours just a society in? And, you know, we do bone marrow, boom, biopsy, MPN1 mutated. And then in our group, actually, weekly, we meet, we discuss every single patient. So what happens if I give this nice lady some kind of AML-like therapy? Well, 10 years later, she's still with us. So that followed, actually, a publication by Dr. Montalban Bravo in our group, where it shows, actually, that the outcomes of these patients with MPN1 mutated disease, if you treat them like an AML-like approach, actually are cure rates that are extremely high, almost 100%. Now, one difference from the canonical MPN1 AML is that they need a transplant, actually. You may not get away only with high-dose cytarabine type of approach for therapies. Now, why do I emphasize that? And it goes back to the discussion hopefully we'll have with Dr. Corey, is that, okay, if you're doing genomics on everybody, you look at the blue book, you're going to say this is AML, and you're going to do the right thing. But if you don't do genomics, you're going to call this patient MDS, because there is no way he can differentiate that, right? And it's only 1% to 2% of the patients. But it's like black, you know, it's like night and day. It's a huge difference in terms of outcomes. And that gives you the really important value of assessing at the molecular level all those patients. And if they relapse and you didn't do that at baseline, please repeat that at baseline, because you will encounter those patients. And you may make a huge difference on, on our patients. And then finally, you know, we heard this uh, targeting of the telomerase. I think this is an interesting concept. But I think that I'm curious about this, because uh, we've published papers in cancer cell that if I inhibit telomerase, patients develop AML. So I don't know actually what is the science behind this kind of compounds and how they actually have these beautiful responses and we have to wait for the uh, phase three uh, results. 
Uh, there are drugs now that are starting to be redeveloped, trying to target the splicing mutations. As you heard from Dr. Corey, these are the most frequent mutations, so we're starting to have nice studies back trying to target SF3B1. There are drugs that are not the specific inhibitors of uh, uh, splicing mutations, but they work better in the context of this mutation, actually discovered by uh, Dr. Amit Berma in, in uh, Dr. Shastri's uh, center. So this actually kind of back uh, 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 an emphasis in terms of uh, blocking uh, these kind of uh, mutations that are so frequent in these patients. And then finally, the bad news, and maybe you can help me here, is that we really need something for P53 mutated disease. Maybe the magrolimab will be a step uh, up, but uh, we really need something that inhibits or does something to this particular mutation. Now, I talk a lot about hypomethylating agent-based therapies, but just two seconds that maybe there is kind of a rebirth of chemo. This is from Dr. Peterlin in France last year looking at CPX, and there's some question actually coming about the role of ELN responses, so maybe we can address that later. But you know, there are some patients with high-risk MDS, those younger maybe transplant candidates for sure that may benefit from more intensive type of therapies. This is the example of an IDH2 inhibitor, in this case, enacidinib in the context of MDS with very high rate of, of, of responses. And, uh, and then again, some of the early data with these IRAC4 inhibitors that target the splicing mutations that at least in relapsed refractory disease are giving us really good uh, uh, marrow uh, responses. So I think we're going to see a lot more uh, coming from this. So to finalize, I think that uh, you really need to use your prognostic models. You really need to like individualize therapy, age, candidate for transplant, candidate for induction therapy. Is there a mutation that perhaps I can target? And then hopefully we'll get these newer modalities, I hope all of them, with these antibodies blocking CD47, magrolimab uh, being the first uh, really exciting compound, uh, benetoclax obviously uh, <coughs> coming along also in, in parallel. And we'll see actually, we didn't mention or I mentioned earlier very briefly that there is a third phase three study that is uh, now ongoing and is starting to, to accrue using uh, this compound known as a tamiboritin that is kind of a retinoid. Uh, more potent than ATRA that is uh, being used in a specific subset of patients that have this particular uh, molecular uh, uh, signature. And then, again, we're really thinking about total therapy in this context, you know, really thinking about how do I integrate all these therapies in patients with high-risk disease. So with that, we're going to go to uh, uh, the case. And um, I guess it's the same poor man that uh, has this disease, Stephen. So 70-year-old man who is tired, has dyspnea, as anemia, and, uh, and now you do this testing, you have the P53 mutation, and uh, has this high-risk uh, karyotype, as you will expect. So what are the options, uh, Dr. Shastri? Yeah, this is actually a good, good question, which we actually debate a lot in our weekly uh, leukemia MDS meetings as well. Patients that have high-risk MDS with a complex karyotype, TP53 mutant, are actually the hardest patients to treat because uh, we don't actually have great therapeutic options and these patients perform poorly even if they are taken to allogeneic stem cell transplant. They don't do particularly well even with stem cell transplantation. Uh, Dr. Garcia Manero, I was actually intrigued while you were speaking, uh, looking at the high, ris high responses you're, that you demo showed with the HMA venetoclax, whether there is some intrinsic difference in MDS with P53 versus AML, because in AML we actually do not see these sort of uh, uh, responses with HMA when for TP53. So if a clinical trial is really an option at our center, we would actually pursue the clinical trial because we do not think that any of the available treatments or allogenic stem cell transplant, uh, you know, uh, really kind of change the, change the disease in any significant manner to these patients, and they may have ultimately AML progression. There's, as Dr. Garcia Manero highlighted, there are clinical trials that we could enroll these patients onto. Magrolimab looks uh, to be a good option. There are NK cells that are looking at targeting more like inflammation and natural killer cells. So there's different strategies that one could pursue in the clinical trial setting. I agree. Actually, I didn't mean that we should give Benetoclax to P53 yeah. to the disease. I'm saying that there's a dogma, and then you see this kind of data. Of course, I don't know how to interpret that, and we need to see the Verona trial, but there is a theme. And actually, at the, uh, this meeting, uh, Dr. Sabona 
has an oral presentation actually looking at oral decytabine cetazuridine for P53 mutated theta MDS with a very high rate of response. I mean, this is something that has been proposed that these hypomethylating agents maybe are why you would not give intensive chemotherapy to a uh, patient with P53 mutated high risk uh, uh, disease. And something that I struggle because my practice is really significantly enriched for transplantation is what to do, you know, should we transplant these patients, should not transplant. I tend to try my best to transplant patients with P53 mutated disease. The question is what is the timing of the transplant? I invented something in my head called time to uh, best response or something like that, that is when can I achieve the best cytogenetic, the best molecular response and something that you actually measure month to month. This means actually that you have to refer the patient to transplant colleague sooner rather than later, and then be ready to go when you think that you have really uh, uh, exerted your maximum effect. Sometimes, you know, there's no response, and maybe this is a total futile uh, uh, approach, but this is really important. And the other thing in these transplanted uh, patients with high-risk disease is this concept of post-transplant uh, uh, maintenance therapy. I know this is controversial, but this is my practice. I think that some of the studies that were negative maybe had some issues in terms of their design, but this will be uh, data, and it did actually, APR has shown some positive data in that particular context, but I think clinical trial today is still the best option, right? Okay, so we already uh, discussed, I think, a lot of what we wanted to, to say here, so, um, so let's say you refer this patient to a clinical trial, and. Um, the patient had the P53 and the complex karyotype. Uh, you had this study open, right, the enhanced study. You know, would that be uh, uh, your preferred uh, uh, study? Yeah, of course. I think this is actually what we did in the United States very quickly because we accrued quite uh, fast to, to that. I think it's going to be this issue of the on-target anemia. Again, I don't think this is really a, a major uh, limiting uh, factor when providing this type of compound. We just have to learn some tissue, some issues actually in terms of blood banking and the you know, priming of the dose. I think that with a little bit of practice, this is basically not a major uh, issue. And again, will people put this patient on the Verona trial? I think probably not. They will have gone for the enhanced trial, right, or for a doublet with uh, magrolimab. Uh, I think we should wait for all these uh, uh, phase three studies to really tell us uh, what happens and if we can really select the best patient. And again, I hope that they're positive and we will be talking about triplets because in my mind, that will really make a, a, a lot of sense. Is there a role for flow cytometry in MDS? Very quickly, I saw a group from uh, uh, the Netherlands who are like world experts on this. So what yeah. do you think about yeah, this? Yeah, well, this was, uh, you, you wouldn't be surprised. This was a, a, a subject of discussion at the WHO classification. Yes, there is a role for flow cytometry in MDS. Is it sufficient to make a diagnosis of MDS on flow cytometry? Not yet. I would say that's the quickest and, answer I can give. And at least if we can sneak in a, a lot of them. This is very important. What about BAF, for instance, for yeah. P53? And why at MD Anderson they don't give you the BAF? Can you explain that to me? Uh, I, can, I, I will plead the fifth on the second one. <laughs> okay. but, uh, but, but, uh, so variant allelic frequency is a very important concept in mutation profiling. Um, for, for just to level set, it refers to the amount of cells the disease burden that carries a particular mutation. And um, I would say the sixth edition of the WHO classification has to address VAF, and this is really the next frontier. I think it's not enough for us to say P53 mutation, yes or no. There are so many questions within, within that sim single variable. Is it one mutation, and where in the gene? Is it a low VAF? Is it driving a lot of cells to proliferate? Or is it a low VAF? And, and thus, at least theoretically, the cells that carry it are not able to dominate the bone marrow. So can I ask a quick question about yeah. that? Because and in Spanish, we say something like twist the envelope or something like this. So the way to address this will be by doing single cell analysis. So do you see that that kind of technology will be in a clear lab at some point, really telling us what's happening here, or, or that's like too difficult? I, I would say it's too difficult at okay. this point. Yeah. Question for Dr. Shastri. So this question that I get asked all the time, lenalidomide kind of out of context, non-del5Q, is there a role? When do you use that, if ever? 
Yeah, this is a good point. So, I mean, as we know, lenalidomide, specifically with the Del 5Q, has very high responses. But uh, if there are low-risk patients that are particularly, uh, you know, just cytopenic but not progressing, they don't, they are not having high blasts or progressing to AML. Sometimes they can go through a lot of therapies in clinic. You know, they go through ESAs. Uh, you know, losparacept, and then in this context, if they, you know, sometimes I do offer them lenalidomide for non-Del5Q, but with the caveat that the response rate is literally less than, is half or maybe even less than half of what we see with the Del5Q. That being said, you know, even patients with non-Del5Q can respond, you know, so the, it's, but, but, you know, I would say that this is something that you can offer after a nuanced discussion because there is published literature in this field by Dr. Raza and others that it's sort of like, 30% or even around that ballpark of, or, of response with uh, off-label for non-Del5Q. I think there are some sets of patients, let's say, with good platelets, diploid, with yeah. anemia that may respond, RAS-T may respond. And then one last question, Carmine, for myself, because I think this is very important, that is, it is a question saying, uh, can you uh, consider the combo of um, ACE and MAGRO kind of as a pre-transplant strategy. I think actually this is what we're discussing today, that this kind of doublets, they have such a high rate of response that actually we're gonna see more and more patients being transplanted with less disease and hopefully better outcomes. And I think actually in my mind, that's what we're gonna see in a few years, that the survivals are happening because combinations like this one really are allowing us to take people to transplant with a lower uh, leukemia burden. And I think with that, I think we finish, right? Thank you very much for staying all this time and uh, again for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash PMQ860. This activity is supported through educational grants from Garon and Gilead Sciences Incorporated.